Welcome everybody to our newest episode of podcast Bridging Voices. Uh, today we have a really distinguished guest here and also a friend, I would say, uh, Nino Kalandatze from Georgia. And we want to start with a short introduction and then dive into like all these uh, various topics that uh, happened in Georgia over the recent months and years, um, which gives us a lot of uh, topics to talk about, uh, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, yeah, Nino, uh, welcome, first of all, and uh, so happy to have you here. Um, you have been here before uh, in November um, for like a really interesting discussion also with EU officials. So we're really looking forward to that. And yeah, with that, I would just like uh, ask you to shortly introduce yourself and uh, what you're doing at the moment in Georgia with your work. Thank you, Dennis. It's a great opportunity to talk about uh, our work, what we are doing, how we are trying to contribute to general democratic development in the country, what's on our side, uh, and to have this opportunity to talk to you mm, on Georgia, on the political landscape, how it is going on or developing uh, particularly since the Ukraine war mm, and how it may affect uh, the developments in the region and uh, then accordingly for Europe and, and for Brussels. Um, as uh, you already mentioned, I'm representing the Javjavadze Center. The center is uh, the first civic society organization in Georgia that was modeled after the mm, European political foundations. Mm, unlike traditional uh, political foundations uh, in Europe, uh, we are political but not partial. Um, we work, uh, therefore, with, uh, with uh, diverse um, social groups, uh, also with political parties. Mm, we do, or the, the um, full name of the Javjavadze Center is uh, the Center for European Studies and Civic Education. So we do Uh, some research and studies, uh, but a lot civic education. Uh, and uh, as I said, while, while we are working with uh, different social groups, our main target still remains uh, youth outside the bigger cities. Uh, we target those uh, who lack access to uh, informal education, um, who uh, um, are less, less exposed to the West, um, speak probably um, little English or no other foreign languages uh, other than perhaps Russian and uh, therefore are very susceptible to widespread uh, disinformation in Georgia and propaganda. And uh, through civic education we are trying uh, to also build resilience uh, and um, somehow prepare Uh, our new generation, how to resist uh, the, the propaganda and, uh, you know, how to tackle with it on a daily basis. Uh, we have uh, basically two major projects uh, we are implementing. Mm, this one is civic memory uh, that concerns um, with uh, refreshing the memory on recent history and also targets mainly those who have not lived uh, throughout the 90s uh, and um, what we are basically trying is to give everyone uh, a bigger picture of historic events to better understand the political context and uh, to better uh, understand the mistakes that the society has done before and how to avoid repetition of those mistakes. Mm, this is uh, a very interesting big project uh, that is uh, being implemented with the generous support of the Adenauer Foundation. We have recorded 20 documentaries uh, on the events uh, that um, have taken place um, back uh, during the 90s uh, in Georgia. Mm, and uh, it has become a very popular project uh, among uh, the students, among the school children. Mm, but also among the civil society that is concerned uh, with history and uh, future developments in Georgia that are very much dependent on real understanding of historic uh, recent uh, past events. Um, second uh, flagship project uh, of ours is uh, intra-party democracy. This is where we work with civil society organizations. We work uh, with... Um, Uh, party grassroots in political parties uh, on a larger scale. 
promoting intra-party democracy is uh, a big issue uh, for the Georgian society, firstly because it is, uh, in uh, our view, not sufficiently understood as being a problem for democratic development in general, but rather regarded as a internal problem of political parties. Uh, however, the, the problem is that when you see, and I assume it's a general trend everywhere, but particularly in Georgia, there is an alarming trend of rising dissatisfaction towards, towards political parties and political processes. Um, just to give you a sense of the numbers, the recent uh, polls conducted by NDI and IRI have indicated that over 70% of the Georgian voters do not trust political parties and do not feel represented by any of the existing political parties. Uh, and that makes uh, the political process pretty challenging, particularly given the fact that among uh, those political parties uh, are very much affected the opposition political parties. Uh, distrust towards is even higher, and uh, the the Georgian opposition voter would cite ninety uh, percent of them would cite that they would even uh, um, that they, they would not trust the um, political opposition parties, which makes um, a landscape pretty fragile in a sense that. We have uh, a ruling party that is uh, being a governing party for 11 years now in power mm, with its uh, lowest of its support uh, um, since they have been in power. Uh, and uh, there still is no alternative uh, that can capitalize um, on, uh, the, on the popular demand and on the popular power. And um, again, this uh, this makes um, this makes um, political decision making, uh, you know, very dubious. Makes uh, pretty corrupt. It uh, alienates the voter. It uh, discredits the entire political process. And this is where they think uh, that uh, key to starting to solve the problem is tackling it with introducing internal party democracy within the political parties. This is where we believe, firstly, the parties need to become democratic, then to regain trust of their voter, uh, to become more representative in a sense that once they have a uh, democratic rule of, uh, you know, renewing its structures, attracting uh, new politicians, uh, attracting real electoral leaders, Mm, that this may change the landscape in a sense that people again um, regain trust into politics and into political parties, and then uh, eventually change, um, you know, the general situation uh, that makes people so dissatisfied, uh, makes them, you know, empathetic, makes them. Uh, nihilistic makes um, you know human capital migrate uh, and uh, which in turn then affects general uh, development of the society mm, these are the major projects we are concerned with we are, we also uh, closely work um, uh, with uh, schools and school children uh, we have a very popular project of uh, uh, movie screenings and discussions uh, with school children. We screen um, some classic movies like Twelve Angry Men or Rashomon, and then have an open discussion uh, with uh, with children on how to promote critical thinking, how to promote uh, or encourage citizenship, and eventually um, put in place uh, you know a critical amount of young people who would feel responsible for the future of their country, for their own future, and would more would be willing to get more involved um, into the general decision-making process. And this is how we try to encourage um, civic engagement into political processes. Quite a lot of ground to cover for us now. <laughs> um, but uh, really interesting. And, um, of course, we also... Um, talked about that with, with EU officials when uh, you were lastly here. Um, but of course, we also looked all to Georgia with um, like quite shock, I would say, uh, when uh, recently there was a 
published this this um, draft law and then uh, later the law uh, on the foreign agent um, uh, discussion, which you can maybe also like uh, give us an impression also what it had as an impact for your work as well and uh, how it shaped your work. Um, and then, of course, um, what recently happened um, was what what uh, what Putin tried with basically the visa freedom. Um, so there's a lot of things going on in Georgia. So um, what do you also expect uh, from these events for the Georgian elections um, that are happening next year? Um, let me put it that way. Um, a lot has changed since uh, the Ukraine war, since uh, the full-scale invasion, uh, Russian invasion into Ukraine. It has changed uh, the political landscape in geopolitics on the ground, and, and it has a direct effect uh, on Georgia. Mm, and um, if uh, this can be put it uh, this way, Georgia can benefit from the situation in a sense that um, now since Ukraine the western attitudes are changing completely mm, we have lived through 2008 and then again 2014 when Russia invaded first Georgia and then uh, Ukraine and uh, we could not have even dreamed of such a consolidated west and its consistent Western policies towards Russia and towards the region. This gives us uh, a historic chance and opportunity to get closer to the European Union and to, to eventually get there for what we've been as a society fighting for for 30 years, um, getting close uh, to Europe and to European Union is has been our foreign policy objective and goal mm, since uh, the very beginning of our independence. And uh, so far, all the uh, national governments have pursued that path that is different with the current government. The current government uh, has chosen a different way. Uh, it has uh, chosen a... Um, in the meantime, I would say a very anti-Western direction uh, and uh, decided to get closer to Russia and also to put Georgia and Georgia's EU perspective at risk. Um, while we have been seeing uh, a number of anti-Western policies being pushed through uh, the current Georgian government, one of them is, uh, or there are many, but it uh, was an extreme example um, in, uh, in, uh, that has taken place in March. Um, last March, where they have tried to push through uh, the law on foreign agents, basically meaning that they would, uh, they would want to identify all the national and international organizations uh, that would have been funded uh, by the uh, Western partners. Uh, and uh, they would start controlling those organizations, controlling those, uh, the, the finances of those organizations, uh, and then eventually end up, as it did end up in Russia, with closing and shutting down all the critical organizations, all the civil society organizations that may have uh, been, uh, you know, critically vocal against the government. And this was a threat that was widely and surprisingly widely understood by a bigger society. Um, initially, we thought, um, you know, people would not think of it uh, as an aggressive law. Uh, but it turned out that particularly the youth and the younger generation understood it as understood passing this law uh, as something directly um, yeah dedicated to turning us away from the European Union away from our chosen path and uh, we would end up being uh, in a you know modern Soviet Union 
Uh, and uh, this alarming sign was uh, luckily understood in a very, um, yeah, a very strict way by the population. And uh, the world has observed how, you know, thousands of young people would rush into the streets and physically defend uh, their chosen uh, path and chosen policies towards the European Union. And this made, in turn, Brussels, but mainly the uh, the uh, you know political partners in the capitals, very much attentive towards Georgia. Uh, if they had um, you know some justified skepsis towards Georgia, now they realized uh, these people are true Europeans who really need to really need to get invited into the European bigger family and have a chance to develop their country democratically. Uh, geopolitically, this means that we may have a chance now um, that if uh, a positive decision is made um, by the end of this year to, uh, to grant Georgia the candidate status, uh, this, uh, this would mean that we might finally get away from the Russian influence uh, once and for all uh, and get a chance to peacefully develop our country uh, in the right direction, in the direction that was always a chosen direction of the Georgian people. That's uh, quite passionate and I obviously hope that uh, that would be the case. Um, also, let me like maybe turn towards uh, what you already said. Like, there's more dissatisfaction with political parties, but also you see a positive turn of more young people towards politics in general, um, political decision making, and also like uh, movements. Like you saw that now with the election win, for example, in Thailand. You you yourself said that it's a lot of young people who basically stood up against the foreign agents law in Georgia. Um, what makes it so specific also for the elections next year? Uh, which role does young people or do young people in Georgia have to play in the in the future of the country? Uh, well, again, a lot will depend on uh, the decision that will be made uh, in December. Uh, this will, um, I assume, empower all the pro-Western movements uh, in Georgia. Uh, but when it comes to elections, um, it is still remaining a challenge. Uh, because uh, the uh, Georgian political or electoral landscape is uh, being very compromised. And uh, as you know, elections are not conducted on the election day and election results are not decided on the election day. But elections um, um, or election outcomes are often predecided uh, by those uh, who conduct the elections and uh, this is a longer process way longer than just you know a month of observation prior to the actual election day mm, and the ruling party that is being now for the second or the fourth, third term uh, with the uh, majority uh, it managed to consolidate its political and administrative and financial power um, in as much as it still can affect the election results and outcomes in their favor without having sufficient popular support. And this is certainly a dilemma for the, for the Georgian society, for the political society. It is also a dilemma for the uh, for our European partners, uh, because at the end of the day, when the candidate status is granted, and hopefully it is granted, they will have to work with the actual representatives of the country. And if uh, and the dilemma is created by the fact that those are the people who are led and controlled by one person, that is the Russian oligarch, the system of ruling in Georgia is an oligarchic one. It is not a democracy. It is it is a you know one person rule. While democratic Europe will have to deal with the fact that they will be working and also financially aiding 
the government that is uh, not particularly democratic and that is not particularly pro European, and um, this is still this is um, I think this is something um, European politicians will have to find out a way how to cope with the situation. In my understanding, um, the best case would be uh, to understand uh, that the status needs to be granted to the country uh, to keep Georgia close to Europe, uh, to be granted to the people who deserve it, uh, not to lose Georgia in the region because Georgia remains pretty much the only ally uh, for the European Union since um, you know, there are uh, there are new alliances coming up such as uh, Aliyev Erdogan alliance uh, Armenia will uh, it's a matter of time when it will turn away from Russia because uh, uh, considering the recent events uh, uh, Armenia no longer relies on Russia as being a reliable partner um, so at the end of the day, they will try to find uh, some new ways. And uh, Georgia remains the pretty much the only country in the Caucasus region uh, that can be considered as a strong partner for Europe and for the European, uh, for the European countries. Um, at the same time, um, at the same time, there, w there will some measures uh, have to be taken against the governing party that has been behaving badly, very undemocratically, and are basically trying to impose an you know an autocratic way of management um, that is being imposed on the Georgian population already for the last eleven years. Uh, but uh, but um, you know just give them a sign that uh, it cannot continue even if they stay in power and uh, this is uh, most effectively I'm sure done uh, by certain types of sanctions or at least a threat of sanctions you know not to divert from the actual path the Georgian people want. It's, it's super interesting, and especially like what you also mentioned in terms of the regional and internal politics. Um, you spoke about the Erdogan Aliyev alliance. We have to see what happens with the Turkish election in the second round, which we saw already on, on, on Sunday that it's going to be like um, um, like different. Um, and then we also like um, spoke earlier about uh, what role basically Ukraine has for uh, the Georgian fight uh, for EU uh, membership. So, for example. Um, That, EU, uh, that, that Ukraine pushed and pushed and pushed to basically also get the means to defeat Russia on the, on the battlefield. So what does that also mean for Georgia? You, you, uh, you basically um, mentioned already some points, but basically what could that mean also for Georgia and especially for, for December? Is that a positive sign? Um, Ukraine is um, fighting our war. Ukraine is fighting for our freedom. Um, Everything uh, that is happening in Ukraine now um, has uh, the same underlying reasons um, why Russia has invaded uh, Georgia in 2008. Um, Russia has invaded both countries to push Europe out of the region, to push NATO out of the region. That's the only purpose they have. And, uh, and um, the, it's, it's the same battlefield. It's just today doing by the, done by the, by the Ukrainians. Uh, but it is rightfully understood by the broader population in Georgia that it, that it is pretty much our war. Mm, and also many Georgians are fighting, in fact, in Ukraine because it is for their freedom, for, for the freedom of their children and for the peaceful development of the region. So we are very much in the same boat there. And uh, we can 
only be thankful to Ukrainians that they could now achieve what we could not in 2008 because we weren't too small, because uh, Russia back then was understood to be uh, way stronger, because, you know, because of many geopolitical um, understandings and also misconceptions uh, towards Russia. And Ukraine did an amazing job to convince the entire world that it's worth fighting against a tyrant and that Putin is a tyrant and Putin is a, you know, leading a a terrorist regime um, uh, that is never going to obey internationally accepted rules. Um, And uh, this is a game changer. This is a game changer for the Western countries and it is a game changer uh, for the regional countries uh, and for Georgia in particular because otherwise... Uh, there, otherwise we wouldn't have even that perspective of, uh, you know, of getting the, the uh, European uh, membership status uh, now. And uh, this has opened up uh, huge possibilities uh, for Georgia if there was now, you know, a national pro-European government in place, then we probably already would have gotten the candidate status because Georgia was uh, once front runner um, when it when it came to you when it came to euro integration um, the association trio was uh, in fact uh, put in place because of Georgia uh, back then uh, and uh, and uh, we were way forward when it came to you know, when it came to uh, to successful reforms, when it came to, you know, putting democratic institutions into place. Um, but because of, you know, because of the, I would say, wrong government um, being now uh, at a wrong timing um, at power, um, it, uh, it creates certain challenges uh, while, you know, um, Ukraine and Moldova uh, could have been more successful uh, or, or were more successful and Georgia could have been as successful as well, um, but it failed to do so. But I'm still very hopeful um, towards uh, the decision that is to be made in December um, because I have the feeling that the West understands well the political context and it also is um, pretty much tied of uh, the uh, you know of the signs the Georgian people are sending uh, to the European capitals, and we also see a huge change not just within the um, political elites of uh, the Western countries, but also on a popular side that there is since Ukraine there is a um, you know huge turn. Uh, when it comes to assessing uh, current Russia properly, but also to assessing how important the region may be uh, for the European security. You mentioned it's quite like one one quite important point: how important the European region is for security. What, in your opinion, has to happen until December? Like maybe two or three um, recommendations and steps that the EU need to take, or that the EU should foresee not only in terms of Ukraine, but also in terms of Georgia? Uh, well, firstly, to stay very close to Georgia, to stay close to all the pro-Western organizations, uh, political, non-political, um, it doesn't matter, but with all, and to work closely with all of them, to maintain this, uh, you know, right assessment of uh, political landscape to really understand uh, uh, in deep understanding what is going on on the ground to uh, to really picture that once the o- the war is over and hopefully soon there will be new European borders defined and that uh, Georgia needs desperately to be on the European side rather than on the other side uh, of, of that border, 
what is being very much pushed by Russia for mm, and contributed by our government uh, uh, too. And uh, watch closely the upcoming elections. Understand that the power being now in Georgia will never become uh, European. They will never try to push European policies uh, in Georgia. Just, um, you know, stay open-minded with uh, open eyes and uh, do not, um, you know, do not feed the capitals with the illusion that there is a chance to work with this government in a way that would benefit Europe or Georgia. Uh, and uh, in a short term, you know, just be positive uh, when it comes to the decision in December mm, and uh, see it in the long run and assist not the, you know, not necessarily the, the ruling elites, uh, but particularly the society to get through this, uh, yeah, this vicious cycle uh, that is now being dominated by not necessarily uh, pro-Western forces. Yeah, thank you, Nino, for like a really in-depth uh, discussion and also your valuable experience from, from uh, Georgia, which I found super interesting and I assume our audience as well. Um, yeah, thank you for your time and uh, also the, the patience in the, in the fight for freedom uh, and democracy uh, in the region. Um, and uh, we remain hopeful, of course, for December. Um, and uh, to all the audience, um, feel free to uh, listen also to our other po podcast episodes that we have online. Um, we cover a lot of different topics and uh, I'm sure they are, uh, uh, they are as interesting as our conversation with Neil today. And uh, with that, I, um, uh, I want to wrap up and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. <laughs>